The process of creating new antibiotics and understanding bacteria with particular mechanisms of resistance is like a dance. It's a lot of back and forward in terms of understanding the movement of resistance and also understanding where antibiotics can work and when they don't work. In 1928 in London, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin from a mould. A decade later, a team at the Dunn School of Pathology at the University of Oxford demonstrated the clinical utility of penicillin. So penicillin has been estimated to save over 200 million lives since its first use. But penicillin and drugs like penicillin can easily become ineffective. And that's because of AMR, antimicrobial resistance. So AMR is a normal and ongoing process driven by evolution. Bacteria can resist drugs in several ways. They can evolve into ways the, the drugs no longer enter into the bacteria cell. Bacteria can also secrete enzymes or proteins that destroy the antibiotics. And bacteria can also evolve such that the, the drug is no longer effective. So the target that the drug was originally going for is now no longer critical in the bacteria's survival. There are several reasons as to why AMR is becoming a problem. One of the main drivers is misuse of antibiotics, or overprescription of antibiotics and overuse in particular in farming. So this increased usage of antibiotics can often lead to the occurrence of multi-drug resistant bacteria causing multi-drug resistant infections um, and these have often been labelled as superbugs. So at the moment in this evolutionary arms race, I think we are losing because the bacteria can produce resistance faster than we can create new drugs. The Ineos Oxford Institute of Antimicrobial Research, or the IOI, is bringing together researchers from different disciplines, namely biology and chemistry, in order to understand mechanisms of bacterial resistance and also to develop new compounds and drugs to treat antimicrobial resistant infections. While AMR is a, is a normal process, going back to that dance between the creation of new antibiotics and the involvement of antimicrobial resistant mechanisms, it has been accelerated by the overuse and mismanagement of antibiotics. However, we can change the steps in the dance. We can look at this through a different way and we can try to increase our knowledge and management of antibiotic usage whether this be in the clinical world or the agricultural world. There are steps that we can take to understand how we can edit our usage. The first step to understand antimicrobial resistance or AMR is to really appreciate what the usage is. So understand who is using what antibiotics across the world. In order for us to fully understand AMR, we need a huge data set. We need a global data set, we need a contemporary data set. We need to grasp the worldwide context to understand the what, the why, and the where of resistance. So for us, it's important to work in low middle income countries, um, particularly in Nigeria, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, for example. And not only is the problem of AMR worse in those countries, but the data is sparse and, in some places, non-existent. AMR disproportionately affects low- and middle-income countries, and we do see that the number of deaths, the number of uh, prolonged illnesses, the number of disability that arise from antimicrobial resistant infections, especially in children, is higher in low- and middle-income countries, yeah. which is why I'm so pleased that IOI is actually conducting the study in Nigeria. One of the um, topics that we're going to be exploring in a lot of detail through the collaborative work that we're doing in Nigeria is, is Barnards. And, and Barnards is our project on uh, sepsis in newborns, um, particularly in the first 28 days of life. So yeah. now we have this great opportunity to further the work in Barnards and, and, and other studies where we can collect that data, we can collect the bacteria, we can collect the clinical data um, to really understand the, the current situation of AMR. 
There is no way you can solve a situation if you don't have actionable data. So for instance, in Barnard's phase one, where we looked at bloodstream infections in newborn, we went to places like Abuja and Kano, you know, but this time around, we're looking to have a more robust data yeah. to better understand what's going on in the country in terms of uh, infections in newborn babies. In order for us to achieve that, that we need to ensure that we, we, can, we go to visit Nigeria, we can work with our partners and we can decide what's most important for the study and for the data together. Yeah, yeah, that's really important, you know, and, and that's where, so IOI, in all of this, IOI is more like a facilitator because yeah. most of our projects are in-country led, you know, and that's where capacity building comes into place. I'm really, really looking forward to the study, not just because it fits the vision of IOI, but because of the impact it's going to have on people in lower middle income countries like Nigeria. Obviously, if they understand what pathogens, what bacteria they're dealing with, they will be better able to treat them. It takes many years and many hundreds of millions of pounds to develop a new drug and a new antibiotic. Many of the large pharmaceutical companies have withdrawn from the field of antimicrobial research because in many cases uh, it doesn't make economic sense to keep developing new antibiotics. Because you spend many years developing a new antibiotic and once it's clinically approved and it's available you don't want it to be widely available. It's a bit of a paradox that you develop a great antibiotic but it's not one that you want to use extensively because you're just going to exacerbate the problem of AMR. And so many of the new antibiotics that are being developed are being developed to be put on the shelf and used as a last resort. So the economic incentives that you would typically have for other drugs is just not there at the moment. And this is where working in academia and where the IOI come in because we are not necessarily driven by making a profit on a new molecule. So the idea of the IOI was to bring together clinical microbiology and chemistry and working directly on the most relevant bacteria with uh, the expectation that when you do find a new molecule that inhibits the growth of the bacteria, kills the bacteria, then it more quickly translates to real world applications and in particular in parts of the world where it's most necessary. In our human drug development programs, we look at developing new antibiotics, but also looking at new combinations of compounds. So it's almost like a feedback loop. Um, we as biochemists will uh, identify targets and develop tools to probe those targets and then we'll go to the chemists who will synthesize new molecules. We can test those against our biological system and then we can understand which parts of different molecules uh, give us the best chance of getting a drug and then we can go back to the chemists who will synthesize some new molecules and the process repeats and repeats until we've got something that's usable in the clinic. And one of our most advanced projects is to develop a combination therapy where a carbapenem, which is an antibiotic, often used as a last resort antibiotic, is no longer effective with some of the latest strains from around the world. So one of the strategies we use is to target the uh, enzymes that actually uh, provide this resistance. Uh, so in the case of penicillins, there are classes of enzymes that break down the penicillins into inactive components. And what we can do is develop molecules that block these enzymes and therefore protect the penicillins almost like a guardian angel. And therefore those, uh, the penicillins will have a longer lasting effect in the body. Developing new antibiotics is very difficult, not only to find new targets within the bacteria that are effective, but also most of the antibiotics that we have work most of the time and they are cheap and widely available. And in the case of their use in agriculture, oftentimes the, their use is not regulated. They're used as growth promoters. There's little to no data as to how many antibiotics are actually used on farms around the world. So the use of antibiotics in animals is one of the major drivers of antimicrobial resistance across the world. Approximately 80% by mass of antibiotics are used in animals. 
uh, because they're cheaply available and help uh, produce healthy livestock. By developing specific antibiotics for animals versus humans, uh, we can separate out the pool of antibiotics used in both and protect uh, last resort antibiotics for use in humans. And this specifically, one of the three pillars of research of the IRI is trying to address, which is to develop animal-specific antibiotics. So essentially, our research is mainly focused on whether we can find antibiotics that we can only use in animals. So we are facing a very serious scenario. Is most classes of antibiotics has been used on food producing animals, and half of those antibiotics being given to animals are considered as critical, medically important to human health. So the whole idea of our research is if we can find some new therapy or new drugs that we can only use in animals, in doing so we can remove all the human medicines and replace with animal-only antibiotics so that we can potentially minimize antimicrobial resistance and safeguard human medicines. Glistine has been considered as a last result antibiotic to treat life-threatening human infections in clinic. I think the story of glistine starting to be known by people is in 2015 in China. So the research group in China has found a gene called MCL1, which stands for the mobile glistine resistance. So this gene, MCL1, was not only increased resistant gene in bacteria, but also it was carried by a plasmid, which is a small pieces of DNA. It's not part of bacterial chromosome, so it can move freely within bacterial world. It can jump from one bacteria to another bacterium and even transfer to different species of bacteria which can raise the possibility of spreading of antimicrobial resistance. So since the discovery of MCL1, MCL variant so far has been reported spreading over 45 countries spanning six continents. After finding this antimicrobial resistance, the scientists in the UK and in China, they worked closely with Chinese government. And then in 2017, Chinese government decided officially banned glistine as a growth promoter in animal for feed. On top of that, the Chinese government banned all the antibiotics that used as growth promoter in animal feed. If China can make the first step of bank glistine usage, then it's kind of like sort of have a leading role of minimizing antimicrobial resistance globally. The mission of the IOI is to rapidly advance research, education and collaboration in search of solutions to tackle the growing threat of AMR. AMR is a growing problem, but if we take the right steps and we do the right science, we can combat AMR. There is no end game in this dance with nature. The music will never stop.